This video is sponsored by Paradox Interactive. Just as I'd been doing with my developer diary videos, Paradox asked me what else I would like to do for them in terms of pre-release videos. A lot of diaries feature breakdowns of start positions of several countries, so I suggested start position videos and they've made it happen. So thank you to Paradox for that. So before we jump into our first country, it's worth mentioning that I don't have time in this video to explain every mechanic or what everything means, so if you feel lost, consider checking out my developer diary recap videos They explain the entire game, topic by topic. First up, it had to be done, we have Rome. Rome are essentially the largest power block in Italy, they have the biggest population, and while the Etruscans to the north have more cities overall, Rome has four fedatory states that solidify their territory across the width of Italy and will come to their aid in wars. They're not invincible though, the Etruscans and their allies closely match Rome for their size and population strength, as do the Samnites who are allied with Lucania. If Rome wishes to expand into these territories by force, it's going to need to ensure that both sides don't join together against them, else they'll be trapped in a war on both fronts against greater numbers. A more passive approach would allow Rome to absorb its fedatory states over time, naturally growing without spending the gold or manpower on war. Bigger nations can then be acquired through client state status and integrated later. This could be achieved because of the surrounding Latin nations, but once tribes of different cultures are encountered, they cannot be so easily integrated without force. Diplomatically, Rome has no official allies, just fedatories, and pretty much all nations around it have a slightly diminished opinion of them. This is because Rome has a bellicose diplomatic stance, which is their way of saying they're ready for conquest. This allows Rome to claim territories for 10% less than usual and have slower war score gains, but the trade-off is other nations are more adverse to you. Strategically speaking, Rome do have a big advantage over their southern counterparts in particular. They start with access to iron, horses and wood resources, which allows them to field heavy infantry, heavy and light cavalry, and to build a navy. Now the reason this is significant is because the entire south of Italy and Sicily have no direct access to iron or horses. They'll need to import it through trade if they want it. There's 16 nations to the south of Rome in Italy and Sicily alone, and there simply just won't be enough trading partners for iron and horses to go around. So depending how the trade falls, Rome could end up with a very big advantage militarily. Culturally, Rome is Latin, and 98% of its population belongs to this culture group, so it's pretty unified. Religiously, they are Hellenic, with about 98% again being Hellenic, so again, quite unified, and the same is pretty much true for the surrounding nations around them. This means that they won't have to spend their oratory or religion power converting the pops they acquire early on from conquering. For further ease of expansion, being Hellenic means Rome will have an easier time expanding into Greece than it would into the Druidic North, just food for thought. Rome is an aristocratic republic with one leader who serves a term of 5 years and then has to wait 10 years before that leader can be in power again. The republic is broken down into 5 political parties, one for each power resource in the game and one for a populist faction that always has a little bit more support than the others. Rome starts with 20 established families, which is quite a lot for their size, as you'll probably only ever have about 13 or so government positions to fill in the early game, so plenty of families are going to be unhappy that nobody in their family has an official job and their loyalty will fall. Expansion is somewhat necessary to create military and governor jobs just to keep the families happy, or you'll have to try and rotate them around the jobs. That's pretty much it for Rome, definitely an easier start and a good starting point for newcomers to the game as there isn't much pop management needed until you expand beyond Italy and you essentially have all things you need to create a robust military early on. Next we have Epirus. Epirus only have 8 cities but they have a very strong population for their size, about 75% of which is free men which gives them a big solid base of manpower to draw from. Because of the large, impassable mountain ranges of Greece, Epirus cannot be attacked from the east. They can only be attacked by land through two choke points to their north and to their south. Diplomatically, Epirus have just one ally, Talantia, to their north. Talantia also have eight cities, but approximately one third of the population of Epirus. They also have a high opinion of Epirus. Now this would allow Epirus to build relations and eventually client state Talantia, and if relations progressed, integrate them to double their size peacefully before taking part in any wars. This would essentially strengthen their position against the real major power in Greece, Macedon. Macedon are fairly untouchable to Epirus. They're about five times as strong as them. They're allied with Thrace, and as well as that, they have Argos, Euboea, and Paeonia as subjects. Further to that, 
Macedon is guaranteed by Egypt and the Seleucids who will back them up in their wars. Now because of this, Macedon realistically is just better suited as an ally rather than an adversary, and the divided city-states of the Peloponnese are a much more lucrative endeavour for Epirus to take, as are the southern colonies of Italy. Strategically, Epirus are in a bit of trouble. They have no horses and no iron, and neither does their ally. They only have one province, meaning less trade routes, so they absolutely need to prioritise building relations with any nearby diplomatic partners that have a surplus in these resources. Should Epirus not be able to secure either resource, there are several mercenaries nearby that will provide what they need, but even so, without the resources these armies will not replenish cavalry or heavy infantry should they take casualties. Culturally speaking, Epirus are 100% Greek and 100% Hellenic for religion, so pop management is pretty easy for them early on. They also almost have no tribesmen, so you can really just focus on boosting the citizen, freeman, and slave output with buildings, resources, and technologies, without having to worry about an entire class of population. If a technology or resource pops up that helps tribesmen, you just don't need it. Epirus are an aristocratic monarchy, giving them a stronger focus on oratory ideas. As a monarchy, their rulers rule for life, and they start with the young boy king, Pyrrhus Aegidae, a great leader to have, and so long as he doesn't fall ill or get hit in the head with a tile, you could expect to have him for the better part of 50 years, and his base martial, finesse, and oratory are quite strong, giving you a nice stable income in those fields for a very long time. As well as that, his legitimacy as a ruler starts at 100%, and there's only 6 Epirot families to manage, so your country is really one of the more stable ones in the game. I can't really see how you'll have any problems internally early on. However, you will need to always keep the loyalty of the pretenders in check, but this shouldn't be difficult with so few families and a strong base income of oratory power to begin with. That's essentially it for Epirus. I would say that their start is medium, maybe leaning a little on the hard side, but the fact that they have a solid leader, good manpower and a few choke points means you could survive without much of a problem. Bad army composition and powerful countries surrounding you is what you're going to have to overcome. Next up we have Athens. Athens start with just four cities and a pretty low population. They're fedatory to Phrygia, which means they have limited diplomacy options and will be forced into Phrygia's wars. So before we go any further, we're going to need to discuss our options. The big priority is avoiding integration. Phrygia can only integrate Athens if Athens' opinion of Phrygia is 190 or more. This means if Phrygia were to use the diplomatic action to improve opinion, they'd be able to integrate you after just a few years. Now to combat this, you can straight up just insult them. This will give them a CB to attack you directly should they wish, but at least it will avoid straight up annexation for a while. So what are you to do? How does a nation with 4 cities attack a nation with 400? Well, you find allies and you find powerful ones. Even though you cannot ally as a fedatory, you can still improve the relations of others around you. As we mentioned for Epirus, Macedon are guaranteed by Egypt and the Seleucids, big nations that all border Phrygia, so improving the relations with these nations will be beneficial. Alternatively, you could look to improve the relations with the city-states of the Peloponnese and hope maybe to join a defensive league with them, though they're so small, it's a lot more unpredictable how that's going to go. You're doing all of this in the hopes that when you break away and declare war in Phrygia, the others will support and join you if you ask them to ally. It's a really big uphill battle though, they won't really want to join a war against the odds and you can't wait until they're in a war with Phrygia as you'll be on Phrygia's side. The only other option is to hope that Phrygia don't integrate or attack you and basically just collapse in on themselves, or fight their wars that allow you to grow beyond being a fedatory. The problem with that is that Phrygia already have a stake in Hellas with two cities there, so they're most likely to give themselves territory rather than to give you territory. Athens are a democratic republic, which means they'll need senate approval on their diplomatic actions. So if you do plan on going to war with your overlord, you'll need the backing of the senate first. The nice thing about a democratic republic is they have idea slots for military, civic and oratory, so it's a nice balanced approach. Internally, they have 15 families with a bit of disloyalty already brewing, but there's just not really much to be done about it other than rotating the jobs around and frequently issuing out bribes until Athens can expand. Athens do start with the iron resource, so fielding heavy infantry will be no problem, though they don't have access to wood for a navy or to horses for cavalry. Phrygia has a large navy that could make taking islands around the Aegean very difficult if you're in a war with them, as they can just blockade your troops, leaving them stranded on the islands. Culturally, Athens are 88% Hellenic and have 88% Hellenic religion. 
Essentially, there are some Jewish and Hebrew pops living in and around Athens itself, and at the cities of Imbros and Lemnos, there are a few tribesmen pops. With such a small population though, it's easy to convert them all very quickly, should you wish. And that's it for Athens, a very hard start in my opinion, where you'll need to play fast and loose with diplomacy and you'll need to be very vigilant with the diplomatic situation at the time of everyone around you. Not only do you need to find the right time to strike, but you also need to have your government in order to do so. Pericles is going to have his hands full while he's in power. Following on from Athens, we have a country in a very similar situation, Judea. Judea start with 20 cities and a very thinly spread population. They also start as a tributary of Phrygia, giving a portion of their income to Phrygia each month in return for protection. So Judea face similar challenges to Athens, however they don't need to worry about integration, but they are still limited by what diplomacy they can do. Now unlike Athens, Judea starts sandwiched between two major powers, Phrygia and Egypt. So even should they become independent, there's far less options on the table of where to expand. It might again be the case that Judea's best hope of expansion would be to claim territories in defensive wars until they can get big enough to push against a crumbling Phrygia, and that is if they crumble. With their hands in three provinces, Judea have a decent amount of resources, including horses, but they don't have iron. Should they wish to get heavy infantry, they'll be looking to import it elsewhere. Judea use the Levantine and Arabian military traditions, which gives bonuses to camel cavalry, but they don't produce their own camels, so importing camels from Egypt or the Seleucids would definitely be beneficial if you decide to go down that path. Judea is a theocratic monarchy, which means that they take more religious ideas as their preference, and they'll get boosts to omens and omen power if they fulfill those ideas. They're also led by Simon Zadokai, 40 years old with a strong effect on oratory and religious power as a ruler. The primary culture is Levantine, and the primary religion is Judaism, with about 98% of the population being unified. The government is also very unified, with 100% legitimacy for Simon, and very loyal pretenders as well. There isn't much internal management to worry about here. So without much diplomatic freedom, and without much internal strife, Judea just kind of have to sit there for a while and build up their religion, maybe use it to boost themselves where they can with omens. You'll no doubt be playing the diplomacy game again, waiting for the right moment to strike against Phrygia, or help them out if they come to blows against Nabate or Egypt. A medium to hard start. Continuing our theme of subject nations next, we look to Bactria. Bactria are quite unique in the fact that they are quite a large nation, the fifth largest in fact for population, but are a satrapy of the Seleucid Empire. They control 99 cities, which places them one city short of being a major power. Their power ranking doesn't really matter though at first, as they're not in control of their own diplomacy, other than trade. So again, you're going to be at the mercenary of your overlord to decide what you can do and where you can expand, if at all. And should your country opinion be pretty high, you may get integrated. Now, integration takes longer the bigger the nation is, so for Bactria, you'll have plenty of time to notice it and end any current wars you're helping the Seleucids in, and then turn on them yourself if you want to survive. Like the other subjects, you can always try rely on other powerful nations that stand up to the might of the Seleucids. The Morians, a behemoth country with the biggest population and city count in the game, could make for a wise investment to sweeten them up and get in their good books. That is risky though, as you don't really want someone that big getting bigger. A different take would be if you see that Parthia, who are also a satrapy of the Seleucids, revolt against them. It'd probably be a good opportune time to absorb them yourself or maybe ally with them and join them in breaking away from your master. Now, as such a large nation with over a thousand pops, Bactria is much more divided amongst themselves. About 15% of their population is Hellenistic, which is your state culture, while the rest are Bactrian or Scythian. Your religion is Hellenic, but it only accounts for 25% of your population, so religious conversion and cultural assimilation will be very important steps to take if unrest and loyalty are to be reduced, as well as granting you stronger omen powers. To keep the different cultures happy, you can employ governors with matching cultures to their regions, and you can also change your laws to allow for cheaper conversion of religion. Being such a large nation, Bactria has access to almost all resources necessary to field a diverse military, including camels, steppe horses that provide horse archers, regular horses for cavalry and iron for heavy infantry. If they want elephants, the Morians have plenty available to trade also, so Bactria have an extremely diverse arsenal at their disposal only missing out on chariot units because that's just not in their military traditions. Bactria use Persian military traditions, which don't have chariots. Now, Bactria itself is an autocratic monarchy, which gives them slots for military, civic, and religious ideas, which, if they use, gives a bonus to slave output. 
Now Bactria's slave population is about 20%, so it's definitely worth using the right ideas as Bactria's income comes predominantly from slaves tax early on. Now back to the government briefly, Bactria have wavering loyalty for their pretenders, and their basilis, Sophites, is looking to have a son. The clock is ticking for him though as he's 50 years old, but his 19 year old wife, who has a 6 year old daughter by the way, should get the job done. If not, the most prestigious character from the most prominent families may take the throne, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you could end up with a ruler that has conflicting culture or religion, and it'll just make things a little bit messy. Last thing Bactria needs is more culture conflict. Now, which brings us to the issue of money. Because of the culture and religious diversity, a lot of provinces have unrest, which lowers their output for pretty much everything. So Bactria starts with a healthy treasury, but losing money each month. It's imperative that Bactria make their slaves happy to maximize their output for cash and get the country's economy kickstarted again. That's basically it for Bactria, a really fun nation because of how big they are, how conflicted they are, and the fact that they're a satrapy. There's also a lot of internals to get right before expansion can really be considered, and there's a lot up in the air about the family lineage. In my opinion, a very, very fun start, and probably a medium difficulty one. Our last country to take a look at today is Armenia. Armenia are the 7th largest nation in the game for population, at just over 700, and start as a major power, owning 126 cities. Diplomatically, they're a blank slate, no subjects, no alliances, or CBs on anyone. Armenia really can expand in any direction they want and carve out their own destiny. Now, your main adversary, however, is most likely to be the Seleucid Empire. Conquering them almost in their entirety will allow you to form Persia and become an empire gaining claims on large swaths of territory around you and bonuses for 20 years to culture happiness and freeman output. This, of course, is available to all Persian culture group countries, so you don't have to do it, but it's a good goal to work towards. Geographically, Armenia has a series of mountain ranges that create nice funnel choke points to their southwest and to their north. This means that Armenia is quite a defensible country, and placing forts in these choke points will slow enemy advances considerably. The supply limits are really low though, due to a widespread of the population across all of the cities, so there's few places that can maintain armies without attrition. It'll be important for Armenia to build up the supply in a few key locations near forts, probably by moving pops around, so that they can easily defend without suffering unnecessary casualties. Armenia, just like Bactria, are an autocratic monarchy. This means that they get more out of their slaves if they match their ideas. Their entire population is 100% Persian, which makes culture an easy thing to deal with, but religion is a bit more fractured, with Zoroastrian being their state religion, but only making up 15% of the population, so religious unity is very low, which hurts your omen power considerably. This means your religious power would be better spent converting your people than performing omens early on, and you could also use the governor policies and laws to help the conversion process. Resource-wise, just like Bactria, being quite a large size allows Armenia to pretty much have everything it needs to form a good military, including horses, step horses, and iron. However, they don't have access to camels or elephants, so you may want to look for a trading partner for those. In terms of families, Armenia is a close-knit community of just eight families, which makes it quite easy to appease their loyalty. However, expansion into more regions and fielding more armies may leave you looking to incorporate foreign families if yours don't grow quickly. Now, in terms of the monarch, Orontes III is the Zayathia, with no children of his own, though he's only 30 and his wife is 20, so the family line has ample opportunity to prosper. And that's essentially it for Armenia, a pretty easy nation to play, I would say. I mean, I don't think they have any immediate threats, as the big nations like Phrygia and the Seleucids will be largely busy with each other. And even if they are attacked, Armenia's population is quite high and terrain is quite defensible. Their internals are also pretty stable, other than the religion issue, which on its own is quite manageable. And that's it for the video. I hope you enjoyed this look at six of the most interesting star positions in Imperator Rome. I chose these based on the comments we got in the last video. Sparta was heavily requested as well, but I thought we'd leave that just until next time, as we covered a lot of Greek nations already in this one. If you have a country you want to see, I'll be doing more of these videos just before release, thanks to Paradox, so let me know. I'll try to take a look at more Barbarians too, if possible. If you liked this video, please consider leaving a like on it as it will help me do more videos like this one. If you want to find players who like similar games, consider joining our Discord where we run community games each month. If you want to support this channel directly and increase the amount of videos and community games we run, consider supporting on Patreon like these lovely people on screen did. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.